Good evening. You're watching the News at 6 with me, Shan Russell. The News at 6 is all about the day's biggest developing stories and we'll be filling in on them over the next half hour. But first, the headlines that we're tracking right now. Prime Minister Narendra Modi holds bilateral talks with Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. Lankan PM backs Indian Army surgical strikes in POK. Cabinet Committee on Security reviews security scenario after surgical strikes along the LOC and international border. Prime Minister Narendra Modi advises ministers to avoid speaking out a turn on the issue. Three scientists, Jean Pierre Sauvage, J. Fraser Stoddart, and Bernard Feringa, share the 2016 Nobel Prize for Chemistry, all three awarded for design and synthesis of molecular machines. And tensions escalate in Syria. Russia sends advanced missile system to port of Tartus. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says efforts to end the war will continue. Our top story this evening, the Cabinet Committee on Security met on Wednesday to discuss the security scenario in the wake of the surgical strikes on terror launch pads across the line of control. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who chaired the meeting, is understood to have advised his ministers to avoid chest thumping on the issue of surgical strikes. Amidst multiple incidents of ceasefire violation by Pakistan in the past few days, the Prime Minister has once again reviewed the security situation along the line of control and the international border. At a meeting of the Cabinet Committee on Security on Wednesday, Home Minister Rajnath Singh gave a brief on the situation along the border and in Jammu and Kashmir. Defence Minister Manohar Parikar, External Affairs Minister Sushma Suraj and the chiefs of three forces were also present in the meeting. Later, the cabinet also approved amendments to the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Bill 2014, which seeks to safeguard rights of HIV-affected people to prevent and control spread of HIV and AIDS. Vishal Dahiya, Rajasabha TV, Delhi. And the BSF on Wednesday seized nine Pakistani fishermen after their boat entered the Sir Creek area in Gujarat. The BSF patrol noticed a wooden fishing boat which had ventured, ventured into the Indian waters. The nine Pakistani nationals are being questioned. Even as sources say nothing objectionable had been recovered from them. The seizure comes at a time when there is heightened security due to tensions between India and Pakistan. The BSF had seized an empty boat belonging to Pakistan Rangers on Tuesday as well after it drifted from across the border into Punjab. Another Pakistani boat with nine crew members was apprehended off the Gujarat coast by the Indian Coast Guard on the 2nd of October. The UN's highest court on Wednesday threw out a case brought by the tiny Marshall Islands against India for allegedly failing to halt the nuclear arms race. The 16-judge bench at the International Court of Justice will rule later whether the Pacific Island nation's battle could continue against Pakistan and Britain. The archipelago is seeking to shine a fresh spotlight on the global threat of nuclear weapons. But the court found it lacking the jurisdiction uh, in the case as there had been no prior record of dispute or negotiations over the nuclear issue between Marshall Islands and India. The tiny Pacific Island nation witnessed a string of nuclear tests in its atolls between 1946 and 58. The tests were carried out by the United States as the Cold War arms race gathered momentum. Now, Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, who was on a three-day visit to India, met Prime Minister Narendra Modi today. The two leaders discussed a host of bilateral issues with cross-border terrorism figuring prominently in the talks. The Lankan Prime Minister also lauded India's efforts to curb terrorism, referring to the surgical strikes carried out by the Indian Army to destroy terror launch pads in uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Vikramasinghe also called on SARC countries to come together against terrorism. Prime Minister Narendra Modi held bilateral talks with his Sri Lankan counterpart Ranil Vikramasinghe on Wednesday. While the closed-door talks touched on a number of issues of mutual and regional concern, the focus remained on cross-border terrorism. The Lankan Prime Minister said all South nations must come together to end this menace. What I've discussed with your government has been how does South evolve from here? What do we do there? Then uh, how do we ensure, as I, I commended the Prime Minister and the government for the restraint is has shown in handling the issue. Then let us see how, what else we can do. That's, that, that's I would say is 
let us look at getting things back so that there will be no cross border terrorism in india or any other country speaking to the media post the meeting the lankan prime minister asserted that the alliance between india and sri lanka is more robust than between any other country in the region but there are a lot of interesting projects we are doing with india i came and discussed it uh, we are de- developing uh, part of the highway system we are looking at uh, cooperation in some of the security fields we are work- we are with the singapore and subana jorong is developed and went off so that's all our relationship with china is the economic relationship it's not a military one and it's a part of the by the time we took power they had, the chinese had already uh, given the loans for the building of the amban tota harbor and the airport but there was what we did they, they, they turned out gone beyond we had a airport and we had a harbor and nothing else so we discussed with the chinese where they are going ahead where they have industrialization of that area uh, if they build the harbor and if they build the airport let them make use of it they are coming into the we also in we have all we earlier in the day ranil vikramasinghe also met external affairs minister sushma swaraj and home minister rajnath singh he also called on congress president sonia gandhi and former prime minister manmohan singh sri lankan prime minister has clearly said that the future of south asia is closely related to india's prosperity and so cross border terrorism must be in the agenda of sark akhilesh soman for raj sabha television with camera person shiv kumar in delhi the singapore prime minister lee shen loong called on Pre- president pranab mukherjee in new delhi today the president welcomed the visiting dignitary at the rashtrapati bhavan where the two held talks on a wide range of issues a delegation of ministers and members of parliament accompanying the singaporean prime minister were also present Prime Minister Lee is on a 5-day visit to India. On Tuesday, Lee had held summit level talks with Prime Minister Narendra Modi during which the two countries signed three agreements. The Singaporean Prime Minister will depart for Udaipur later today evening to attend the launch of the Center for Excellence for Tourism Training which has been built as part of the Skill Development Collaboration under the India Singapore Strategic Partnership signed in November 2015. Now, outlining the goals in ending extreme poverty by 2030, World Bank President uh, J- Kim, uh, sorry, Jim Yong Kim highlighted some of the huge challenges for developing countries such as India. Ironically, these stem from the use of technology and automation. That, he says, can fundamentally disrupt the pattern of traditional economic path. His remarks come at uh, the time, at, in fact, at the Brookings Institution on the eve of the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF. At a time when the world economy is grappling with an era of low growth, the World Bank president has a cautionary take on the effects of technology and automation on jobs and incomes in countries like India and China. Research based on World Bank data has predicted that the proportion of jobs threatened in India by automation is 69%, in China 77%, and in Ethiopia the percentage of jobs threatened by automation is 85%. World Bank President Jim Yong King feels that the facts call for a deep review of the methodologies that are needed to fight poverty in developing countries. Now, as we continue to encourage more investment in infrastructure to promote growth, we also have to think about uh, the kinds of infrastructure that countries will need in the economy of the future. You know, we all know that technology has and will continue to fundamentally reshape the world. but the traditional economic path from increasing productivity uh, of agriculture to light manufacturing and then to full scale industrialization may not be possible for all developing countries the world bank president also feels that issues like child stunting and malnutrition have made india's workforce extremely vulnerable and leave it incapable of competing globally i i strongly believe that we have to dramatically increase our aspirations both for the quantity and quality of investments in health, education and skills. If we don't, and if we don't do it quickly, not only is it a recipe for poor economic growth, but we'll leave a large population of people living in countries where the traditional low-skilled jobs are not available and who often through no fault of their own simply can't compete. 
mechanization and technology have disrupted traditional industrial production in many countries. The World Bank president feels the way to achieve higher rates of inclusive and sustainable growth is not through isolationism and protectionism, but rather the solutions call for more cooperation, greater economic integration and stronger partnerships than ever before. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Time for, uh, in fact, uh, time for us to take a short break. We'll be right back with lots more. The splendid, grand and massive new Buddhist copper dome of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. It gets its influence from stupa at Sanchi. The dome is more than twice the height of the rest of the building. The reinforced concrete shell of the outer dome began to be formed during the beginning of 1929. The last stone of the dome was laid on April 6, 1929. Tales that inspire. Stories of social change. A salute to diversity. Promoting public discourse. Events that motivate. Inspiring the innovative spirit. Watch Rajya Sabha television documentaries. The sacred relics of Buddha were unearthed in Piprava in Uttar Pradesh. Buddha. Buddhist monks from all over the world visit the National Museum to pay their respects. These charred bone fragments of Buddha are housed in the gold canopy gifted by the royal family of Thailand. Life after death was a cardinal belief in the Harappan civilization. Reflecting this is the skeleton of a middle-aged woman with gold bangles. Excavated from Rakhigari in Haryana, it's an example of the burial practices in those times. Much like the Egyptian mummies, vessels, eatables, ornaments were kept near the dead body in the hope that they would be of use to the person in the next world. Welcome back. You're watching the News at 6. Time for a quick update. All the national news updates now and nationwide. Heavy police force was deployed at Uttar Pradesh's Bisara village after a 22-year-old accused in the Dadri lynching case died in a Delhi hospital due to dengue or chikungunya. Police said the accused Ravi, alias Robin, was in judicial custody and hospitalized two days ago after he complained of pain. His family members allege foul play, saying he was beaten up in jail. Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi today said that farm loans will be waived and power travel tariff will be reduced to half if the Congress comes to power in the UP Assembly polls next year. He is speaking to farmers in Maniharan in Rampur during the Kisan Yatra. Rahul also accused Prime Minister Narendra Modi of not fulfilling promises made by his government. The Madras High Court today said that RSS members cannot march in half bands across the state to celebrate Vijay Dashmi next month. The High Court said that they will have to wear full trousers. According to reports, about 200 to 300 RSS workers will march in each of these processions next month. ISRO today postponed the launch of India's latest communication satellite, GSAT-18, due to heavy crosswinds. It is slated to take off in the VRs tomorrow on board a Ariane space uh, rocket from Kourou in French Guyana. The launch has been uh, scheduled between 2 and 3.15 a.m. tomorrow. 
The Delhi High Court dismissed petitions of some private companies challenging the decision of the Ministry of Coal to club all sectors barring power under a single category for coal block auctions. The decision comes after almost 18 months when it was reversed on April 13, 2015 on the plea of four companies. Now, three makers of the world's smallest machines have been awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for 2016. The Nobel has been awarded to Jean-Pierre Sauvage, Sir J. Fraser Stoddart and Bernard L. Faringa for developing the molecular machine. Announcing the prize in Stockholm, a statement from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences said, The development of computing demonstrates how the miniaturization of technology can lead to a revolution. The 2016 Nobel laureates in chemistry have miniaturized machines and taken chemistry to a new dimension. The Academy said molecular machines will most likely be used in the development of things such as new materials, sensors and energy storage systems. The three scientists will equally share the prize of 8 million Swedish kronor or close to a million dollars. This morning you ground your coffee. Maybe you used a motorized vehicle to get here. You used man-made machines operating on the centimeter to meter length scale. It's been the dream of scientists for over half a century to take this development all the way down to the molecular scale. That's nanometers. A nanometer is one million times smaller than a millimeter. In here, we have some molecular machines. A molecular motor, a molecular muscle, a molecular memory, an elevator, and there's a molecular car. This amazing development is due to several ingenious chemical innovations. Now, just 30 days before America goes to the elections, uh, the country witnessed its first and only vice presidential debate of 2016. The debate pitted Hillary Clinton's running mate, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, against Donald Trump's sidekick, Governor Mike Pence of Indiana. In a 90-minute long debate, both the vice presidential hopefuls launched attacks on the presidential nominees Trump and Clinton. The debate was held at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia. In the first U.S. vice presidential debate, Democratic Senator Tim Kaine and his rival Republican Governor Mike Pence faced off on Tuesday night. The candidates clashed on a range of topics including national security and immigration. Their sharpest exchanges, however, centered on Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The 90-minute debate saw the low-key Kane go on the attack from the start. This campaign in 2014, he said, if I run for president, I will absolutely release my taxes. He's broken, his first, he's broken his first promise. Second, he stood on he the stage last week. He, 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 he stood on the stage last week, and when Hillary said you haven't been paying taxes, he said, that makes me smart. So it's smart not to pay for our military. It's smart not to pay for veterans. It's smart not to pay for teachers. And I guess all of us who do pay for those things, I guess we're stupid. Pence, the governor of Indiana, responded that Trump used the tax code just the way it is supposed to be used. Trump has filed over 100 pages of financial disclosure, which is what the law requires. But he said he and would release his tax returns. The American people can review that, and he's going, Senator, All right, he's going to release his I need tax to ask returns when the audit social security. is over. R Richard, the Richard the Nixon released tax returns when he was under audit. They're raise your taxes. Gentlemen, We're if you can't meet the 58-year-old Senator Kane also criticized Trump's complimentary remarks about Russian President Vladimir Putin. On Russia. So let's start with not praising Vladimir Putin as a great leader. Donald Trump and Mike Pence have said he's a great leader. And Donald Trump has, no, bus we has, business, dealings, has business dealings with Russia that he refuses to disclose. Hillary Clinton has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia as Secretary of State to do the New START agreement to reduce Russia's nuclear stockpile. She's had the experience doing it. She went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Russia and lodged protests when they went into Georgia. And we've done the same thing about Ukraine, but more than lodging protests, we've put punishing economic sanctions on Russia. Pence, however, contended that Putin will respect Trump because of his strength. In, in the wake of Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State, where she was the architect of the Obama administration's foreign policy, we see entire portions of the world, particularly the wider Middle East, literally spinning out of control. 
I mean, the situation we're watching hour by hour in Syria today is, is a result of the failed foreign policy and the weak foreign policy that Hillary Clinton helped lead in this administration and create. The vice presidential debate saw Pence coming on top with a narrow win, with 48 percent voters saying he did a better job than Tim Kaine. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump and his Democratic rival Hillary Clinton will have their second debate on Sunday. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Now, two days after the U.S. suspended talks with Russia over the Syrian ceasefire, Moscow has intensified its involvement on the ground. Russia has deployed its surface-to-air missile defense system in Syria as it joined the Syrian forces in fighting their way into rebel-held Aleppo. <laughs> Syrian government tanks crossed the front line in the battleground city of Aleppo for the first time in four years as a Russian-backed offensive to retake the rebel-held east escalated on the ground. The intensified attack comes just two days after the U.S. suspended talks with Russia on the ceasefire. Analysts believe the suspension of talks will further complicate matters. فجميع الأطراف المنخرطة هي تعمل على تحسين وضعها الميداني والعسكري وخصوصا في ما نشهده بمعركة حلب وما يتعلق بها كما أن جميع الأطراف تنتظر العودة لطاولة المفاوضات بقدوم الإدارة الأمريكية الجديدة التي ربما the situation in Syria has escalated rapidly since the suspension of talks. Russia has deployed its advanced S-300 VM surface-to-air missile system to Syria. Syrian and Russian airplanes continue their airstrikes on rebels, making a peaceful solution all that more difficult. We will continue, as we have before, to pursue a meaningful, sustainable, enforceable cessation of hostilities throughout the country and that includes the grounding of Syrian and Russian combat aircraft in designated areas. And Russia knows exactly what it needs to do in order to get that cessation implemented in a fair and reasonable way. The U.S. and other Western countries say Moscow and Damascus are guilty of war crimes for deliberately targeting civilians, hospitals and aid deliveries, a charge vehemently denied by the Syrian and Russian governments who say they target only terrorists. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Summer International News Now and Global Buzz. Storm and heavy rain warnings were issued on Wednesday as the powerful typhoon Chaba inched towards Japan. The typhoon lashed the southern coast of South Korea with winds that triggered flash floods and left at least two dead. The storm is set to hit Japan's main island of Honshu on Wednesday evening before moving out into the Pacific on Thursday. All Nippon Airways and Jap Japan Airlines flights reportedly have been cancelled and uh, that is a total of uh, combined 108 domestic flights. Hurricane Matthew pummeled Haiti and moved on to Cuba after killing seven people, unleashing floods and forcing hundreds of thousands to flee the Caribbean's worst storm in nearly a decade. The full scope of the damage, both human and material, remain unclear. Meanwhile, the first evacuations were ordered in the United States as coastal dwellers prepared to flee the approaching storm that is expected off the East Coast later this week. Afghan forces battled the Taliban in the northern city of Kunduz for the third straight day on Wednesday. The U.S. military provided air support to troops on the ground after insurgents launched an attack on the city last week. Since pushing into Kunduz on Monday and briefly hoisting their flag at the main intersection, the Taliban were pushed back by their fighters and are hiding in residential homes, slowing the counteroffensive by the Afghans. Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi on Tuesday said he has repeatedly told Turkey not to intervene in its internal affairs and that he fears the Turkish adventure could turn into a regional war. The statement comes after Ankara decided to extend military operations against terrorist organizations in Iraq and Syria for another year. Meanwhile, Turkey had sent a, said it sent troops to northern Iraq as part of an international effort to train and equip Iraqi soldiers fighting the Islamic State.
Time now for all the action from the world of sports. After signing a one-year deal, Ishan Pandita from Bengaluru became the first Indian player to get a professional contract from a Lali Laga club in, Lega in Leganes, Spain. He was handed the number 50 jersey by club vice president and owner Felipe Moreno. Pandita will start uh, by playing from the junior side at uh, Leganes B. Leganes City is located in the outskirts of Madrid and is currently placed 11th in the league table. Maria Sharapova's two-year doping ban has been reduced to 15 months after her appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. The five-time Grand Slam winner was initially banned by the International Tennis Federation for two years after testing positive for meldonium in the 2016 Australian Open. She'll now be able to return to the tennis court on the 26th of April 2017. Sharapova claimed that she had been taking the drug since 2006 for health problems and had not tried to use a performance-enhancing substance. She said she was unaware the drug had been added to the World Anti-Doping Agency's banned list. FIFA has banned Chile and five other countries after their supporters were found guilty of homophobic chanting. Earlier this year, Chile were handed a two-match ban with one suspended for the same offence. However, this ban, uh, with this ban, Chile would have to find a new venue for the World Cup qualifying match against Venezuela. FIFA approved Chile's suspended sentence following their World Cup qualifier against Bolivia in September. That's all from us. Goodbye.